here we are, the conclusion of over seven years worth of The Office. And now it's time for Steve Carell to go and make his really sad movies. He had no arms or legs. He couldn't see, hear, or speak. This is how we led a nation. Hey everyone, I'm Chris and reviewing every episode of The Office ever here on my channel. And today we're talking about Goodbye Michael. Sick freak, what is wrong with you? This hour long episode, depending on which version you've seen, was a monumental occasion for the series. Greg Daniels was brought in, who was the original showrunner of the series, and he returned to pin this episode. And it was directed by Paul Fee, who'd spent a lot of time as an executive producer on the series, but also directed some of the mega hits for The Office, including my personal favorite, The Dinner Party. Stiff stop, stiff stop, stiff stop! And almost every interaction in Goodbye Michael has some deeper meaning, some in-joke, or serves as some reference point for Michael and his relationship with different people in the office. And this being the office field guide, we'll strap in, buddy, because we're gonna dig into the highest rated episode of The Office ever. Let's go. Well, this is gonna hurt like a mother <laughs> I understand nothing. We open up with Michael sitting in a mid 80s lawn chair thrown up in the sky, looking regal and proud in his Colorado cowboy boots. Cut to a wide shot and we see he's perched atop an air conditioning unit on the roof of Dwight's building in order to get acclimated to the altitude. From this wide shot, we do see that Michael's probably been up there for a little while. And I really am a fan of the Vance refrigeration logo on the back of the truck, which intentional or not is giving me some frame Toby vibes. Dwight joins him on the roof, offering up some fried bull testicles in a like a weird gotcha, but also don't leave us cause you're gonna hate it. But also I'm still mad at you for not recommending me for the job kind of way. We've all been there in some way, right? The theme of this episode is ambivalence, which is having mixed or even contradictory ideas about someone or something. And it sets a solid pace for this episode. And that's because while fans love Goodbye Michael, fans kind of hate Goodbye Michael. It's a rewarding experience to see Michael grow and get what he's always wanted, but it also means that we're losing him. Ambivalence. Oh, thank you, like a butler. Now that line does feel like a callback to the years they collaborated on Threat Level Midnight together. I play Samuel, Michael Scarn's robot butler. Dwight does not play a robot. But in this conversation, Michael speaks some sense into Dwight about the position. You expect to be buttled after Listen, you didn't recommend me? Dwight, I don't under your Mifflin, okay? The job was not mine to give. And I know exactly how Dwight's feeling here because the same thing happened to me years ago. It's it's logically correct what Dwight's hearing, but it's still unsatisfying all the same. Corporate America in a nutshell. But Michael is attempting to rekindle his relationship with Dwight and he asks him some advice. Maybe I should keep a salami in my pocket. Great idea. In order to feed the bears. Michael knows all about Dwight's survival skills, from years of listening to him be weird. And don't let that bother you. Have a bucket there for the blood and the, the innards and the feathers. But also because of the Survivor Man episode. <laughs> Once Michael returns to the office, he gazes out with teary eyes. And it's at this point you have to remember that Michael literally loves these people. He's looked at them as the only family he's really had. As we pan out, D'Angelo is awkwardly sitting next to Michael. And, you know, they have this conversation over desk toys and interviews, which will come up in a minute, but it's at this point that D'Angelo takes the hint and works from the break room for the rest of the episode. The dead man walking. Now, in my opinion, this worked really well because having Farrell and Carell sharing too much screen time would have been a mistake. In this, we get to revel in these one-on-one -on -one interactions without having the comedy and the drama undercut with Mr. Outside Hire but we are gonna talk about that more later. This does set up D'Angelo's downturn. I will be in the break oh, room. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. I'm not saying I'm Superman, but let me just put it this way. If I were shot in the head, I'm pretty sure everything would be fine. But back to Michael, he confirms in a talking head that tomorrow is his last day in the office. And I love the way that Steve Carell plays this. No, I don't leave till tomorrow. So tomorrow I will be a wreck. On your first watch, you're like, okay, well, he's sad. He's pretending not to be, 
this two-parter will probably then focus the second half of the episode on his last day, right? But when you watch his eyes, you know that there's something behind what he's saying more than just sadness. No, I don't leave till tomorrow, so tomorrow I will be a wreck. Knowing that this is, in fact, Michael Scott's last day in the office, when you watch his mannerisms during this talking head, it's clear that he's not quite telling the truth to the camera crew and maybe even to himself in order to stab off them emotions for just a little bit longer. It's a subtle thing, but I think it's what makes Steve Carell's performance so extremely relatable in this episode, and honestly, the way he played Michael Scott from season two and on. By the way, Michael's toys have been a staple in his office since the get-go, and I believe this truck he's talking to D'Angelo about was even featured in the Take Your Daughter to Work Day episode. Then we kick off this weirdly unrelatable B-plot, which is just the day from Andy's point of view. Like, as he goes to the bathroom, Gabe follows him in order to threaten him. I own over 200 horror movies. Okay, that's so weird. And that is a previously defined character trait of Gabe. I got us a compromise. This movie's called Hardware. Now, a lot of people don't like Gabe, which is why I think Zach faded unceremoniously from the show in season eight. But no one, like no one could deliver a line like this. Walk away, bitch other than Zach Woods. Now Gabe, he's feeling a little bit embarrassed and probably distraught after a very public Dundee's breakup. Gabe. What? We should break up. But going after Aaron's ex is pretty impish. Though, it's not like he doesn't have a reason to suspect something is going on. How romantic is this? Super romantic. <laughs> now, Jim does some foreshadowing for the promos episode next year. You guys are filming people when they go to the bathroom now. And later, Gabe uncomfortably follows Aaron into her bathroom. And really, he's trying to make this giant rom-com plea, but it just comes out very cringe. Agreed. Not cool, man. And that's a callback to season three's women's appreciation. I like to go in the women's room for number two. I've been caught several times and I have paid dearly. Now we cut to the party planning committee and yet again, this is very old school feeling meant to invoke a very early office vibe. And the committee is having the great cake debate, which pretty much lasts the entire episode. So Michael said we can do whatever we want cake wise. What do we want? Erotic. How about cupcakes? Why are we even thinking cake? We could do a pie. I think we should do cupcakes. Hey, everybody here loves jello. Let's just get a cake. How about cupcakes? I am one of the few people who looks hot eating a cupcake. Now, Daryl, what if I told you you could have a cake that is delicious and also sexy as hell? I'm listening. Oh, I know what that meeting is about. Of all the people to not ask about cake. Now, having watched Goodbye Michael several times for this review, I think it was too caught up in the intricacies of this exchange about mint chocolate chip ice cream and the implications of that being Michael's favorite to notice this scathing look that Phyllis shoots Meredith here. Mint chocolate chip, your favorite. Mmm. Yeah, that was a surprise. You know what? I'm thinking maybe we should get ice cream that everybody will like. Gotta watch out for them St. Louis folks. That's all I'm saying. She's got some darkness in her. But the importance, obviously, of the scene is Michael's reaction. Now, I can't quite decide which of two ways to read this. Michael's reaction would indicate growth because, you know, he has a clear tendency to make every party about himself. Do you for once just let us enjoy a party instead of making it about all your issues? But also it could be read that he thinks that it would be terrible to force everyone to eat mint chocolate chip ice cream when he's not even going to be there. All of this confuses Pam and it might be one of my favorite line reads from Jenna throughout the entire series. Should we get toppings? What do you like, Pam? What? What kind of topping would you like? Hot fudge? Sounds good. It's like pure confusion mixed with a reluctance to answer. I just, I love this exchange. Fudge it up. I do think we're expected to believe it's a little bit of both of those things here. Michael does know that he's not going to be present for the party, so why make the party about him? But he's also grown as a person and as a boss, and he knows it. I bought this for myself, and yesterday they gave me this. Something about the staff giving Michael a world's best boss Dundee made me cry the first time I saw this episode. It's, it's probably safe to assume that every Dundee Michael has previously received, all of those that we saw in the dinner party at least, were probably awarded to himself by himself, which 
makes this sequence very touching. Not to mention, the cut to the spy shot from outside his window is a callback to the opening credits and a really clever way of invoking the entirety of Michael's arc since season one. Now, Michael throwing that mug into the trash is symbolic, but that's also going to come up later. Now, cutting to a little later in the day, Michael begins to work through his list to say goodbye to people. Now, starting with the most Michael Scott public goodbye ever, Michael makes Phyllis think he's going to divulge a deep, dark secret. She was so cute. And then she makes the most Phyllis Vance thing ever. I, I don't know how to read this look, but I, I love it. Look, Michael, it's a going away present so your hands won't get cold. Ah. Now, these mittens do serve as an hourglass for the rest of the episode. As she's completing them, we know that Michael's getting closer to the end of his day. But they also are a great callback to the mittens that she tried to give Michael way back in season two. So Phyllis is basically saying, hey, Michael, I know you did a lot to help the office this year, but I only care about you a homemade oven mitts worth. I gave Ryan an iPod. And considering how he reacted all of those years ago, it's really huge that Phyllis thought enough about Michael to make him another homemade gift, which does spur the boss to start his gift giving spree. Now, starting with Phyllis, he gives her one of his desk toys. So Phyllis, I am giving you this so you can always remember to speak your mind. Oh, gee, thanks, Michael. You're welcome. It's <laughs> cute. And this toy has been in Michael's possession for quite a while. It's at this point that I can't help but think that these are all really just half thought out gifts. And maybe it was all spurred by what D'Angelo said earlier in the morning. You're not gonna take all your toys, are you? I mean, you don't, you don't have a job lined up, so. This is seen a little bit more clearly when Mike walks over to Uncle Stan. I bestow upon you my felt. Where's the rest of it? It's got no balls. Well, okay. There is a deleted scene here too, in which I'm not entirely sure it goes sequentially at this point in the episode, but you know, here you go. Let us do one last crossword together as brothers. No. Let's... It's called <laughs> and it's art. Which is, I can understand why they cut that. It, it really is a bit that doesn't need to be there, but you know, then Michael moves over to Andy and randomly gives him the top 10 most important clients for the branch. And this probably not only adds a sizable chunk to Andy's paycheck, assuming he doesn't lose them. Michael, I just lost Porter Hardware. Oh, okay, uh, you know what? Just do your best, buddy. But it's also a show of faith of what Michael sees in the guy. And again, the meta meaning here is very obvious. The show was always pushing Ed Helms to take the reins of the office, so it's no surprise that they would use this time to have Michael say something like this. You sold us all on Andy, a product that nobody wanted. I'm gonna lose him. You're not going to lose them. But I promise you that I will. Just do your best. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. For now, we have some stuff to unpack here between Michael and Kevin. Oh. Oh. You know who that is? Oh. Don't be a caricature, Kevin. Never be a caricature. This has always felt a bit meta to me also, in it that Kevin has really become more one dimensional, maybe more than anyone on the series. And it's a little weird that Michael's talk with the guy is so full of possibly terrible advice and possibly sage advice. Again, ambivalence. Saying don't be a caricature is pretty solid advice. Don't just do what everyone expects of you because everyone builds a profile of things about you in their head. There is a version of you that exists in every single person you've ever met, but that doesn't mean you have to behave the way that people expect you to, which is good advice. But then Michael says, You will be thin. You will find love. And this is kind of where he goes off the rails, right? Generally, if Kevin's goal was to lose weight and find love, then this might not be terrible advice. You should never settle for who you are. Because in other non-Michael Scott words, always looking for ways to improve yourself is a good thing. But Michael giving this advice unsolicited does seem to imply that, you know, Michael desires something for Kevin that Kevin doesn't quite desire for himself. Michael, I'm pretty much okay with who I am now. Don't be. Which, by the way, means that he's not being one dimensional because he's breaking that mold. It's just a weird and yet delightful experience that they do pay off with a deleted scene later. You invited everyone into the conference room to talk about cake and I was omitted. Did Michael not just talk to you about being a caricature? This new philosophy is not going to be easy, but it's hard because it's important but it could also be hard because I shouldn't be doing it. Now, Michael's interaction with Oscar is a personal highlight of the episode for me. I think of you as my scarecrow. 
because you gave me a brain. So that's why I made you this. <laughs> it looks like it was made by a two-year-old monkey on a farm. Thank you, Michael. It's beautiful. And he just, he just accepted that I put all this work into it. The fake laughing is extremely hard to sell and Corella is killing it here. But then Michael's shockingly self-aware moment. Oh man, he, he has the lowest opinion of me, of anybody. Oh! It's just 10 out of 10 for me. Angela Sendoff is pretending to care about the state senator and you know, that is what it is, but it does do a little setup for a future plot line. And then cutting over to Andy in this deleted scene, he botches a sale in spectacular fashion. And since you're my client, I think about you night and day. I think about you in the shower. That came out weird. It's not like I at the thought of you or something. But salvages it by asking for a face to face, thus warranting that whole tumultuous sales call we're gonna see in a little bit, in which Andy invites D'Angelo out for. And just, we'll rush through that real quick. After a fast psych up routine. Give me that damn dog, you thief. D'Angelo botches the sale. Absolutely cool. You know what? It was a complete waste of my time. But Andy saves it in the 11th hour, which does kind of have this hopeful, touching victory for the guy. Back at the office though, the reality of leaving is beginning to hit Michael hard. We see this in three parts, triggered first when he's asked about his address in Colorado and he's not exactly certain where it is. Do you have an address yet in Colorado? I'm not sure. Um, Mount Tintun. Sounds beautiful. Then we have a deleted sequence in which David Wallace tells Michael that he's making a huge mistake and basically criticizes the entire population of Colorado. Everybody's a racist. Women don't shave their underarms. I mean, it, it, it... Then over lunch, Michael overhears some office banter about shredding magazines and such, which leads him to cry and symbolically throw away those Colorado boots, which by the way, is the first thing that Creed steals in this episode. Panic is coming over Michael in full force. And again, I love the way that Corral plays this. There's this unbroken sequence in which his freak out occurs which leads him to grab the mug back out of the trash, symbolism again, and then he calls Holly. Just hearing her voice resolves Michael enough to get back on track. Now, I love this path that Carell takes us on throughout this sequence. It's revealed then that this is his last day in the office. <clears throat> yeah, so I know I told everybody that tomorrow is my last day, but I'm, I'm gonna be leaving tonight. After spending some time with the annexed writers of the series, all of which displays relationship with each. Rory Flanderson. You should look him up. She was once my girl and she is your girl now. This is uh, totally unnecessary. If I just went away right now, would that be the best gift that I could give you? Yes, please, please go away. And also, I'm just real quick, I'm gonna get lamb blasted if I don't mention this in the comments. Toby's brother is played by Paul Lieberstein's real life brother, Warren Lieberstein, who was a writer for the series and also was married to Angela Kinsey at the time. But continuing his goodbyes, Michael gives his copy of Somehow I Managed to Daryl. <laughs> That's sweet, Mike. Which is an in-joke from season five. What you people don't know about business, I could fill a book with. Then do it. What? Write a book. Here's a chapter called Gum, mm. with one sentence. Everybody likes the guy who offers them a stick of gum. Mm-hmm, that's true. And then he heads down to the warehouse to use the bailer, a fantastic callback to some of the early warehouse nonsense. Bailer, I hardly know her. Damn it, Michael, pay attention, man. Daryl, I have one last wish. I would like to use the bailer. No. Worth a try. All righty. Daryl said I could use the bailer because I'm leaving. No. As well as the basketball episode. See you later, warehouse. Catch you on the flippity flip. Really? Okay. See you guys. Having a limited amount of time and wasting it on trying to get a trick shot just right is maybe the most Michael Scott thing ever. Around the corner from the warehouse, he has a heart to heart with Aaron, which is just everything. And you know what? You don't need a mom because you have my number and you can call me anytime. And then he seeks to resolve finally everything with Dwight. As a man and as a friend, he is of the highest kind, quality, and order supreme. 245 behind the building, paintball. Oh. <laughs> Now 
Now, Dwight's love for paintball is also a callback from season two's Christmas episode, and it's not the first time that we've seen Dwight shoot paint at Steve Carell. Take that, Steve Carell. Oh, yeah, big movie star now. Also, I'm just going to say that Dwight's trunk space seems a little too clean and organized to believe for a guy that lives like this. I think his trunk would look a little bit more like the Winchesters than something you just got from Enterprise. Now, with only about an hour left before he departs for good, Michael is getting a sense that he's going to miss his goodbye opportunity with Pam, who, by the way, is seeing last year's Oscar award winning film, The King's Speech. Running short on time, Michael triples up his goodbye advice to some fantastic results. Whether you're scared of dying or dying alone or dying drunk in a ditch, don't be going to be okay. Actually, Creed, would you mind giving me back my boots? I think I'm going to give them another try. Oh, I'd like to help you out, boss, but it doesn't work that way, and you know it. Meredith, I actually thought that you and I were going to have sex as well. Well, it ain't over till it's over. Goodbye, dear. And then we get a sequence where Michael is just doing everything he can to take in all of these moments. And he holds a conference room meeting one last time, which has absolutely no purpose. Phyllis, how are those mittens coming? Because I would actually like to bring them home and pack them, and I am leaving for the day at four. He brings Ping in. And I'm here to say goodbye to all you wonderful people. Thank you, everybody. Then I think Jim is finally wise to what's going on. What do you think? Tomorrow? Lunch? You and me? Okay. You're not leaving tomorrow. You're leaving today, right? Now this scene, there's a lot going on in this scene. Krasinski said that the moment he walked in to do his very first take, he started bawling immediately, which is why his eyes are teary before he even says a word here. They had to run through this sequence several times as it was simply too emotional for them. I can tell you, <clears throat> What a great boss you turned out to be. And honestly, this conversation is everything for Michael Scott. It's undeniable validation of his place as a friend and as a boss. I am looking forward to lunch and hearing about what a great boss I am. <laughs> but we're gonna talk about this scene a little bit more in the ratings. As the day finally comes to an end, Michael takes one last look around the place that he has put his heart and soul into for the last 19 to 80 years, depending on the math. The decision to show an afternoon lull with the only noise coming from keyboards and mouse clicks, we're just left with nothing but the feels. Now Creed catches Michael's silent goodbye, showing him the second item that he stole in this episode. See you tomorrow, boss. Later, guys. And with that, Michael Scott leaves 1725 Slough Avenue, never to return again. The film crew follows Michael as far as airport security will let him. He takes off his lapel and he begins to make for his gate. And while it can be counted on now, it was shocking and touching at the moment to see a shoeless Pam trotting over to hug Michael. And with no audio coming through, this moment just lives in wonder, only communicating via talking head as Pam watches Michael's flight depart once and for all. And he was hoping to get an upgrade as an awards member. And he said he was just real excited to get home and see Holly. Cut to tomorrow's goodbye Michael party. The staff have all gathered to celebrate him with pictures of his favorite comedians, basic sheet cake, and vanilla ice cream. D'Angelo relapses again, I guess, and Jim and Dwight say what we were all thinking about a Michael Scottless office. Uh oh. No! but we're gonna talk about that uh-oh in the next field guide. Now, this is typically when I would say something to tease the deeper meaning and cue that transition. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Captain. But while beyond all the office references to the series, which demonstrate Michael's growth and journey culminating to this episode's climax, there's just not a ton more to analyze here. It's all pretty much on the surface. The story touches on this very real human experience of having to say goodbye to someone. T-shirt idea, goodbye stick. 
Some people treat these exchanges without much interest, but some of these are really profound interactions as they recall their relationship with each other throughout their time together. Michael's journey concludes here not only showing how far he's come, but the importance of letting things go and moving on. Funnily enough, I originally planned a full-on character study of Michael Scott for the deeper meaning of this video, but I decided to split that concept out into its own independent video so that we could really spend some time getting into the nitty gritty of Michael's arc and what it meant for that character. So in lieu of that, I just wanna jump straight into the ratings so that we can pick apart the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is the worst. Now it's pretty rare to hear someone pan this episode. Beyond a few scathing reviews on IMDb, which just looking at it seem to be people that are hyper fixated on some aspect of this episode, the critical and fan reactions to Goodbye Michael were generally positive, earning a 9.8 on IMDb, sharing that ranking with the finale as the two best episodes of The Office throughout its entire run. Many reviewers praise this episode for its emotional depth and its ability to provide a satisfying conclusion to Michael Scott's arc. Many critics praise Steve Carell's performance in this episode, with TV fanatic staff writer Dan Forsella calling it a perfect send-off for the character of Michael Scott. This episode was also praised for its use of nostalgia and its ability to pay tribute to the series as a whole. Now, I have two criticisms that I think deserve to be considered. The cuts to Will Ferrell and Andy, that whole plotline pumps the brake on all of the fantastic energy that Good Michael's bringing. You feel that energy? Mm -hmm. It's the pacing, it's the focus on Ferrell being weird, and it's just an odd inclusion until you think about it. Because while this was very much a tribute and a send off to Michael, it absolutely was a welcome to Andy. Now I've talked about this a few times, but I just wanted to pull it all together right here. Helms absolutely was planned to take over the lead of the show. We've seen hints of this throughout the season. And while Krasinski, Fisher, and Wilson were all considered main characters, Carell absolutely became the main lead with the star power that he found outside the office. And with Helms following suit with his breakout work from the Hangover films, he was similarly becoming a household name across America. So it made sense that Helms should take over this lead position. So what about D'Angelo, Jeremetrius Vickers, and Robert California, AKA Will Ferrell and Bob Kazimakis? Weren't they brought in to replace Carell? No! Oh. That's actually a common misconception, something that was pretty well known during the airing of the show, but maybe got lost in the streaming age, is that these guys were never intended to take over the role of Michael Scott. Farrell was only contracted for four episodes and was conceptualized as a way to aid the audience through this transitional period on The Office with a little star power razzle dazzle. And did you know how to high five? Yeah. He wasn't dropped or removed because of fan sentiment. It was always going to be a short-lived affair. Robert California, on the other hand, was not even a thought in the minds of the writers during this period of the series. True that Spader was slated for a cameo in the Search Committee episode, but it wasn't until the off-season that the writers would get a contract sent over and signed for a several-episode arc in Season 8. That's a call I've received many times. So considering that Carell was leaving, Farrell was never going to stay, and Spader wasn't even a thing yet, it's no surprise that they decided to have Michael say things like this. You sold us all on Andy a product that nobody wanted. Just do your best. I have faith in you. And later they had one of the biggest comedic stars of the time saying things like this. He's got potential. It's almost as if we, the audience, hear enough good things about the guy, we're gonna begin to believe it ourselves, which, you know, definitely reminds me of something they made a joke of earlier in the series. Yes, Charles, you wanted me. She thinks that if she says, you wanted me enough, he will in fact want her. It's not the worst plan she's ever had. And this is the problem that The Office had to figure out. How do you make Andy relatable? A character that they repeatedly and purposefully used to show his unrelatability as the punchline. I did this for the little guy, for Joe Sixpack. Wonders how he's gonna fill his car up with oil. Wonders. How am I going to pay my kids' orphanage bills? 
Well, if you recall, they had the same problem with Michael post season one. They employed three main ways, and we see those all checked out in Goodbye Michael for Andy. First, they accentuated Michael's sales ability. Anything you need, day or night, I will be the one to take your call. Keep talking. Next, they wrote characters which would encourage Michael or at least support him. It's like he's an idiot, but he's our idiot. I have faith in you. He's got potential. And then lastly, the writers would end each episodic plot line on an upward or at least hopeful note for the character. <laughs> Good job, we boss. We did it. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> So they're laying the groundwork here in Goodbye Michael. But here's the thing, this foundational transition should have been laid a while ago. At this point, why have Andy take the manager seat? Why not Jim? Why not Dwight? Why not the guy that Michael literally gave his How to Be a Michael Scott manager book to? Instead, the writers were focused on Corral's story throughout season seven. Excellently so, I might add, but these deeper hooks suffered because of that focus. All of that leads to this forced inclusion of this plotline in Goodbye Michael, and the episode suffers because of it. Woo! Yeah! Woo. Now, in addition to my Hello Andy criticisms, there's also a complaint I have, which I'll just call Goodbye Corel, which is basically that this episode is trying to be a fantastic send-off to both Michael Scott and Steve Carell. So there are moments that feel like these interactions are rooted with Michael Scott, and some feel like they're rooted with Steve Carell. Now I'm gonna say something, brace yourself here. Take the scene with Jim and Michael. There's a ton of energy going on here. Basically, it serves as the emotional climax of the episode. Reading this as a goodbye to Michael, then I'd have to say that this moment is generally unearned between these two characters. Sure, there have been some great Jim and Michael moments, but almost all of those happened in the earlier seasons. We do get some bonding from the co-manager plotline in season six, but since then, over a year has passed, Michael's broken up with Pam's mom, and we haven't gotten many one-on-one -on -one interactions between Jim and Michael at all. And in some ways, that was probably on purpose. Like if you think back through season seven, it was mostly the office collectively railing against Michael for something, or the office collectively rallying with Michael for something. One-on-one -on -one interactions were mostly used for just quick bits, sidekick time with Dwight, hanky-panky with Holly, or the showrunners just forcing more for Andy. Andy, listen to me. I thought that you were awesome. Trust that I am telling you the truth. I booed someone tonight. I have no filter. Meaning that it's been quite a while since we've had any meaningful interactions between Jim and Michael. But as the person that we, the audience, are supposed to relate to, most directly in this series, well, at least for the gentleman, I guess, this sequence really feels more like it's intended to be closure for us to have our emotional goodbye with Steve Carell as Michael Scott. And in that, it works, 100%, no doubt about it. But I do remember sitting in awe during the sequence, just taking it all in, but having this nagging thing in the back of my head saying, you know, this, is, this isn't goodbye Michael, this is goodbye Steve Carell. And to be honest though, all of this feels like someone leaving me a garbage bag of gold on my lawn and then complaining about someone littering. For me personally, this is one of those episodes in which the good so far outweighs the bad that it's not even a contest. The emotions, the nostalgia, the pacing, the stress, the relief, the feeling of being in Michael's inner circle and knowing that this is his last day, so much about this episode works. Greg Daniels, while spearheading the cringe comedy of season one, really evolved in how he wrote these episodes over time, opting to lean into these dramatic moments, and yet the comedy doesn't break the experience. It only enhances it. Crying and laughing simultaneously, it's pure ambivalence. Five out of five for me. Where did you hear that? Obvious XM radio. But that's just what I think about Goodbye Michael. What are your thoughts on those two criticisms? The Goodbye Michael versus Goodbye Corel thing and that whole Hello Andy stuff. Apparently, I hated this dog scene so much that I blanked out his backstory. Anyway, that's it for me now. Thank you so much for watching. Join me next week as we pick apart the inner circle. There is no inner circle. I love that one. I've got a lot of things to say about it, though. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Give me that damn dog, you thief!